further ado, uh, welcome to Circles Masterclass. Again, I'm Jeff, and I'm your host for this conversation tonight. Our guest today it says that in life, the mess always comes before the message and the storm before the triumphant story. Wow, what a start. That is the journey of our guest today. He was born in Los, An or Los Angeles in a communal style living to witnessing his sister murdered at a young age, foster care, welfare, abuse, and abandonment. Come on, friends. The story already starts to um, get thicker and thicker. Performing well below state benchmarks were the least of his worries. After decades of camouflaging his past to fit in, he realized to fully live his passion, he must also relive his earlier childhood years boldly and out loud. As a two-time nationally recognized top 10 athletic director award recipient, assistant principal, author, poet, or poet, and philanthropist, our guest uses any vehicle he can to champion his purpose in life, which is child activism. Friends in the house, would you help me please welcome for the first time on the Circles app, my good friend, John Broussard. Let's share some love. John, welcome to the Circles app. We're glad you're here, brother. Thank you, my man. I appreciate you so much. I'm um, honored to be here. Yeah, yeah. Super cool. I, I couldn't hold back the tears from reading your story, John. And you and I have spent a lot of our times together, right, over the last 10 years or so. Um, but I said a mouthful. I wonder if you would start a little bit with your personal story, John, for us and back up that truck and unpack you a little bit. Give us a peek inside. Could you do that for us? Yes, yes, yes. I, I'll, um, I'll do that. Uh, and, and I guess I'll just start off with um, where I am now in life. Right. And I know that we're going to talk about what I've been up to the last few years and how I came to this place. But um, I definitely want to just start off with my current position of assistant principal uh, athletic director in, in, in Marietta, California. Um, and then two years ago, I started um, uh, my own company, 3030 Publishing. Um, the storm of COVID hit me like it hit everyone. And it's, you know, there's a saying that goes, um, you're never the, per the person coming out of the storm as you were going into the storm. Um, and the storm of COVID, you know, set me down. The games weren't going on and, or anything else. Um, and so I, I was forced to stay home and ponder and reflect and be very, very introspective about my journey, uh, how I got to year 20 of education. And through that process, I became really, really convicted about um, just impact, uh, the blessings that I have on my life. And um, then realizing that I want to be able to maximize who I am, which is, as you mentioned, child activism. I, I definitely want to engage and impact and uh, hopefully be a light and cr uh, create a spark for young people around me. Um, and I want to be able to maxim maximize that to the fullest. So having said all that, even you and I speaking now and the journey I've been on the last 10 years, I realized I had to fully embrace um, my past, uh, which which highlights some of the things that you've mentioned um, in my bio. Um, yeah. And you mentioned that you and I, we've known each other. Gosh, if I try to put a year on it, <laughs> at least 10, right? It's, it, it's at least yeah, 10 yeah. years that, that you and I have known each other. And um, there's conversations that, that, that you and I have never had. There's information that you don't know, right? Because yeah. I, I just, it's something I never really, really embraced. But um, um, you know, uh, up until recently, we've had more candid, uh, conversations and, you know, my journey, um, which I kind of share more boldly and more with more conviction now, um, that I did that, you know, I came from an adverse background, you know, um, every single time I talk to a group of people about my, my background, I always use the word society says that I was born in a cult, right? Because I, I was, I, I'm still uncomfortable with, with defining it as that. Um, however, that is what, what, what it seems like society has coined it, but I was born in that, um, you know, at, at seven years old, uh, you know, I, I witnessed my sister get, you know, her life was taken in front of me. Um, and then I took my tour of the foster care system, 
Um, and, and, you know, years or two, about a couple years after that, uh, I, I was placed back with my family just to have my father um, have a heart attack, pass away. Um, and mm. my mom, being a single mom, four kids, um, we got introduced to what poverty and welfare and low income look like in our country. So, I, you know, and that, and that, that took place in inner city Portland. Um, and so that, that was quite the adjustment. And then from there I went. Yep. Yeah. We just, we just lost you, Don. Are you with me? Friends, can you still hear me? Show me some love if you can still hear my voice out there. Yeah, I appreciate you so much. I think we've lost uh, John here for some reason. Um, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, we just lost you, John. Oh, did you lose me? So I had a, yeah. a phone call coming in, so I apologize about that. A phone yeah. call. Can, I didn't know that that it, would happen. Yeah, friends, I apologize. That's one of my things usually that I, I forgot to mention. If you, One of the ways to keep you from being kicked off your phone, if you can throw it on Do Not Disturb while you're on the call, it'll save you from doing that. John, my apologies. I should have given you that heads up before you joined us, but that's okay. Oh, you're so good. glad that you're, you're here. So you're, you're talking us through this upbringing, um, the setting that you were in, uh, the loss of your sister, and then only to be kind of uh, reunited with dad and then dad died of a heart attack is kind of where you were at to lots of this traumatic experience that you've had when you were growing up. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah for sure. And, um, and, and from there kind of went through the welfare, welfare system when my dad passed, my mom didn't have a, even a license to drive. Right. So she was kind of forced to um, really try to shepherd a family of four. Uh, so mm -hmm. we took our tour of, um, really, you know, impoverished situations, welfare, all that sort of thing. So uh, we went through that season of life and then we moved from community to community. So um, how I explain it now is that I went 20 years as um, a patient of childhood trauma and adversity. Uh, and so now as 20 years in education, I'm now a practitioner um, trying to help <laughs> and aid um, young people who may be facing similar things. So yeah. You said something earlier in your introduction, um, John, that really struck a chord with me. And, and even when you had, had shared with me, there were things about your life that I didn't even know. And you and I've had some pretty in-depth, deep conversations about life, right? What, what struck me, John, is what you had said, that the, there are things about me that you don't know. And I think there's plenty of us here in the audience tonight that maybe has this hidden part of us that we don't share. Could you talk a little bit about what do you think is the reason we don't share those deeper parts of us? Because you found that you actually had to come to a point where you could share them. And a part of that sharing was a part of your healing. Yes. Yes. That was good. Let me share that. And honestly, that's a, it's a great, um, it's a great question. Now I'm, I'm a faith based person. Right. And so the yeah. question you just asked, I, I, I'm gonna call that a Holy spirit question. Uh, only because, um, only because that's, that's what I do. Like when I, when I say that, um, I, I started a publishing company, Social Emotional Awareness, uh, the, the book that I authored. I'm coming out with my poetry book now. That's to the foundation and the core of what you said. Why didn't I share uh, the people that are in the room now? Um, why don't they share? And unfortunately, we live in a society where, um, you know, we make it taboo to... Yeah be able to be transparent and vulnerable, um, even though that we were to call to community. So um, I think it's actually a perfect time to share with you uh, my first poem. It's called Diary of a Poet, right? And it, it, leads, it leads right into the question that you just asked, and we'll be able to talk about it, and I'll be able to break it down a little bit. But, um, but it's called Diary of a Poet. It's, it goes like this. Um, Every time I write, I feel God in me. And I ain't trying to sell you God. I'm trying to stop envy. I'm trying to stop hatred. I process all alone to feel less naked and to expose what I feel would be anti. What society described as that guy. So macho, I don't feel anything, you know, that guy. So I get lost in my own thoughts. My soul take its own walks. If life has taught me anything, it's that we all have our own cross outlined in its own chalk. I'm fine, it's just self-talk. I'm lying, it's real talk. I act tough, but I feel soft. 
I write when I feel lost. I find it's the only way to save face, to keep shining but save space. There's so much I don't show. You just see the outer ring. My words are a telescope revealing my inner being. My poems are spaceships and you are an astronaut. This new space, I welcome you. Your face mask, I welcome not. Every emotion here is authentic. Nothing fake or augmented. Just the naked truth with no shame like God meant it. So that, Whoa. That, Whoa. <laughs> that, that, that poem in which I just shared is, is, is the cuss, right? When I talk about diary of a poet, because inside of all of us is stories and emotions and experiences that we face and we don't share them in the way that that the last line of that poem, um, it says every emotion here is authentic, nothing fake or augmented, just the naked truth with no shame like God meant it. What's so interesting is that in the book of Genesis, um, you know, Adam and Eve, and they were naked and they were hiding from God. And, and then God was like, why are you hiding? Like, I created you. And they're like, because we're naked. And God said, well, hold on. <laughs> Who told you you were naked, right? And, and for some reason, like, you know, and, and, and yeah, that's, an, that's a, a faith-based analogy. But really, it's the analogy that leads to the question you asked me. And it can absolutely be translated um to 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 non-biblical uh perspective as well to this idea of why do we walk around and why are we afraid to be vulnerable and transparent yeah right and i went i went so many years uh with that mentality and so these last two years i understood to be able to maximize impact influence and 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 i fully fully want to Whenever I leave this earth, I want to say, you know what, I, I serve my purpose and um, I didn't leave anything on the table. So, yeah, I, I love I, I love the reference of scripture. I love what you're talking about. I know what we live in a society that delineates between what is God, what's not. But, you know, what I love about this space is that this space was be that space in between space. Meaning, yeah. come on, friends, there's no, we don't have to justify it. We don't have to, we don't have to um, uh, prelude something with something so that we don't have to worry about that. Because what, what you said about naked and not ashamed it was the thing that struck me was who told you? Uh, that's yeah. one of the biggest things that I ask myself, yeah. John, when I have these inner conflicts with myself and my inner conflict, anybody in the house tonight have an inner conflict, a voice on the inside, and you have an argument with her or him every once in a while, but that voice comes up in me, and, and I, even, I even ask it, who, who told you? that I was right. that way. Right. Who, who told you you're right. like that? So, right. so talk to me a little bit, John, about how you were able to find this spot within you that hid those things, but, but, but now have found a way to release them. How did you go about that? Can, can you break it down even further for us? Maybe somebody's struggling with that very thing in the house tonight? Honestly, for, um, I th the question you just asked, I think goes down to your why. Um, and there comes a point in time in all of our lives where we have to tie an anchor. Um, our decisions, our actions, our anchor. We have to be able to tie that around something that's greater than us, something um, that is not us, right? Because if it was about me, trust me, I promise you, uh, we, you and I wouldn't be talking right now if, if, um, mm -hmm. if it was just about me. Right. Um, so, but um, during COVID and um, being introspective and just really understanding my spirit and where it was leading me, um, I realized that I was in a position to help, to aid. And I, and I think, right, I mean, there's a saying that goes, um, um, your, your gift is God's gift to you. And what you do with it is your gift back to God. And me being a, uh, me being um, such uh, in a blessed position, right? Like I, 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 I talked a little bit about my upbringing and, and things that I'm doing now. Trust me, I didn't get here alone, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not foolish enough to think that um, I'm smart enough, right? I can engineer the life that I have now. And so for me, I take it as a responsibility and a duty to be able to age, shed light, um, make better, right? Um, the young people, but really anybody who's in a tough spot and, 
that was what gave me strength. Um, I, I, I was mentoring a, a, a college athlete and she came to visit me um, when I was uh, just got done reading. I think uh, not reading, but writing chapter eight in my book. And uh, chapter eight was about my experience in foster care and how it connected to a young person I was mentoring in foster care. And um, and this is a former student. And she didn't know my back story at all. And she read that chapter and she after she read it, she was at my house. She's like, oh, my gosh you have to be really brave. Uh, uh, you have to be really brave to write that chapter and some of the information that you did. I said, yeah, I did. You know, it, it took some courage, but what's, what was scary was the fact that me leaving this earth and not telling that story or aiding someone else and advancing the life of someone else. And so that's why I say anchor. I, I, I This journey that I'm on, I truly put my anchor around other people. I truly put my anchor around allowing every space, every room um, that I'm in to be better. And in order for it to do that, I couldn't just be hot. I couldn't hide or be selfish or anything like that. So that's what kind of sparked this journey. Yeah, I, I, I love what you're saying, friends. I, I, are, you, are you enjoying tonight already? Friends, if you're just joining us, we're talking to John Bussard. John is sharing his story about a very difficult upbringing, the murder of his sister, um, growing up in abject poverty, but finding a place within him, even after all the trauma that he's experienced, finding a place in him that he's turned his shame into a superpower. And that superpower is simply just letting out what's on the inside. And I just hope that you're hearing what he's putting down tonight and want to already take a moment to encourage you that if you're struggling with a steep story, something deep inside of you that you feel still ashamed of, maybe tonight you'll find some hope. And what, John, you just said, there's somebody in the world that needs to hear your story, Fred. Somebody is going through exactly what you've lived through. And for you to bring that story public or help somebody else by sharing it is going to set them free. Uh, I love it. I wonder, John, if I appreciate your sharing of the poetry. I was I was happy. I wanted us to all snap fingers at the end of that. Come on, uh, come on, friends. Uh, I, I was I sitting you. in the, I said in a spoken word area. You got another one? Can you drop on us before we go into a transition? You got any more you can share with us? Uh, th well, that one was sparked um, because uh, of, of the question you asked me of, of, of why do I hide? But from a humanity perspective, like, you know, why do we hide? And um, unfortunately, um, I think that's kind of the walls in the, in the, in the, yeah. in the story. That, that, that society gives to us, but really, you know, we're called to be transparent. Um, but I'll, I'll stick along the lines of where we are right now of my story, uh, which okay. is called If You Only Knew. Um, in, this, uh, in this poem um, um, is, is kind of the bio in poetic form that you just read, okay? Super cool. Drop it on us. All right. It's called If You Only Knew. If you knew, really knew, what this three been through, you would question everything except Jesus too. The world dropped the ball, but Jesus came through. I mean, no dreams, just screams and sirens that turn blue. Dang our past, lost my dad, saw my sister killed too. She was beat, hung like sheets, really. We saw our sister killed too. Then we were stripped, we were ripped from everything that we knew into a world, strange world. Dang, man, who are you? No home, just foster homes. Split us two by two. Little bro went with sis. Big bro, I got you. For the record, for your records, that's not the stuff that you do. Fast forward, couple years. Fast forward, more tears. Gray skies turn blue, still questions, no clues. Many blessings came through from above. Thank you. If you knew, really knew what this three been through, you would question everything except Jesus too. Wow. The love is coming for you, brother. Just sit in that for a second, folks. I, I, I and I, I just have to snap. Somebody's got to snap. <laughs> I've got to snap. I've got to snap. John, take a break just a second and elaborate. Cause I, want, I want the people to hear what we just heard. We're hearing from the depths of where you've come from. But I just want to flip it. Tell us again what you do, your current role, 
that you serve in? What what is that role? Yeah. It for us again. Yeah. So um, I'm gosh, year twenty, edu- year twenty uh, of being an educator. Um, it's an amazing, amazing profession. Um, currently assistant principal, athletic director, uh, in an amazing school district of uh, Marietta Unified um, here in California. Um, and two years ago, um, you know, I wanted, I, I, I felt in my spirit to try to maximize um, just the light, the impact, um, advocacy. I probably is the best word. You know, I, 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 I try to coin myself as a, as a child advocate. Um, and in order to do that, I needed to figure out the right way. So, you know, some, some people say, oh, you know, I know John as a poet or um, John came and, and, and he was a keynote or he did a workshop for us, you know, at a certain school or event. But really, I just needed to um, I needed to try to find some sort of brand um, umbrella or platform to really just deliver a message. Right. And in 2023, uh, the message of that, that we all can share, it's not singular. Right. It's just not written or auditory. Social media is a huge platform as well. So how, however or whenever um i'm able to try to uplift and encourage i just try to find the strength and be bold enough to do that yeah you've i want to i want to shift just a second because i'd love for you to talk about your role as an athletic director i know athletics have been huge in your life and working with young athletes and helping them through that journey has also been very huge in in your life um but before we talk that i just want to reiterate a little bit of what you just said Many people that I've had on as guests on Masterclass, John, one of the things that I find that has been a common phrase in all of the guests that I have on is that they found a place within them to help others. And they've been able to help others with their own hurt that they've gone through. And many of them have shared with me, Jeff, the only way I got out of my hurt is to help someone else out of their hurt. And I, and I hear that in you. I hear that you've taken what's happened to you. It's become your mission to encourage others who might be experiencing it, giving them hope that there's a way out of it. Yes? Yeah, I think um, one of the truths that, um, at least I found in my life, but um, one of the truths that I found in every single person's life I've ever met that are on a road of, fulfillment and happiness and complete um all of them have one identifying factor and that is what have broken our hearts also has made my heart right what breaks your heart makes your heart so whatever tragedy adversity or storm that you face um truly that breaks your heart it truly does but what happens somewhere in the midst of that storm and when you make it to the other side is um, a deep care, a deep sensitivity, a level of empathy where you want to be able to help others not go through the storm you did or you want to be able to help navigate them out of the storm that they might currently be in. So that is absolutely true for me, uh, which kind of, um, you know, kind of spotlights what the, the, the introspection that went through me during COVID and, and why and where I am now. Yeah. My wife and I have had this conversation. In fact, we just had it the other day, John. We've been together for 30 plus, almost 32 years now. We've been married for 28. But uh, and, and, and although that sounds wonderful, I think I don't think that many people who hear somebody's story of endurance like that, they really don't know the depth of the pain. But one of the things that Jody was telling me, she said, Jeff, it's been, it, it, you know, it's been a pain to live with you a lot of times because you're so you've experienced so much you've you've taken on sometimes the pain of others but it's your own depth of your own pain this is what was profound for me john she said jeff the 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 depth of your own pain the hurting the hurting on top of hurting has caused you to have such deep compassion and a well for other people Mm -hmm. and at first i would have never been able to see that john Mm -hmm. but that's what i hear in your story see in your story and other people who are on journeys that have had extreme difficult backgrounds, if we allow it, that pain to do its job, so to speak. Um, I've always said this, this isn't happening to you. This is happening for you. But it's so hard to see that it's for me because it hurts so doggone bad at the moment. Mm. Mm. But if I can get out of that. But she said, Jeff, you, 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 you love on such a deep level because you've hurt on a, such a deep level. And that's what you were just saying, brother, in your, in, in your statement. Yeah, that's so profound, man. Yeah, 110%. Like, it's hard to see the way out of a maze when you're standing in the middle of it. 
But when you get to the outside of the maze, you're like, oh, I see the route. I see the purpose. I see the road. Like, right, it's, it's picture perfect clear if you can stand on top of the maze. But if you're standing in the middle of the maze, there's there's very little introspection in which you can, you know, uh, make from that. Uh, but also, like, you, um, you're you describing empathy, Jeff. You're describing empathy. I truly believe that, you know, uh, our, ca our calling, um, you know, when we talk about humanity is fellowship. Right. Like we're supposed to be connected to one another um, and, and and do life together. Um, you know, the, the, the two, you know, strongest verses in the Bible. One is, you know, love your God as, you know, dot, dot, dot. And the other one, though, is love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do that if you don't understand your neighbor. You can't do that if you don't understand yourself. So we're talking about empathy, the ability to um, put yourself in someone else's shoes as if you were them. That can't happen unless you don't face the same storm that they faced. So that kind of comes right back full circle to what you just said in regards to the, the, the pain we face allow us to feel deeply um, in wanting to help and provide aid when someone else goes through that. Yeah. Yeah. As friends in the house tonight, I appreciate you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for those of you who just joined us. Um, empathy. Wow. Sometimes I look back and go, I'm not sure that I would have asked for it. I don't know that I did ask for it, John. I don't know that I did ask for it. But friend, if you're in the house tonight and you're still in the midst of it, I, this is the hardest instruction I think anybody would ever be able to receive. Sit, we, we start to hear this right now, John, in this day and age. Sit with that pain. Be with that pain. We all want to get out of it as soon as possible. We, it, it, it's, it's kind of contradictory to our human nature of survival to stay in something that's hurting us. But yeah, if it's sure. stay yeah, there yeah. longer, right? Yeah, 110%. Because what's interesting is like, like when, um, you know, unfortunately, like we all have um, an expiration date on this side of Earth. Right. Without question. And we don't know what that is, but we all have an expiration date. But, you know, uh, uh, research and data will tell us that when people are on that in line, when they're about to pass to the other side and they ask them what the most meaningful parts of life was, they're going to point to human relationship and um, um, human connection. Right. Um, you know, spouse, child. A best for what like real relationship you can't feel that real relationship unless you feel real emotion um you mentioned you know uh, my title as, as athletic director and what's amazing is um when you, me being a basketball fan what's amazing is when you think about nba champions and um you know even if it's the lakers who have on a championship ring and the celtics who have a championship ring when they meet each other, it doesn't matter the decade, but when you meet one NBA champion and the and, and they meet the other NBA champion, there's an emotion, a level of respect and admiration only because they know the journey, yeah. only because they know the experience. Even looking at the championship ring from the opposing team will evoke an emotion, a camaraderie and a brotherhood of I've been where you've been. I know how you feel. I have great admiration for you. And that emotion of admiration is translated to pain. Right. It's translated to being heartbroken. So that's part of the human spirit. And unfortunately, I think it's, it's, it's seasons of that that we all must face if we really want to say that we've experienced life fully. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So well said. Friends, I hope you just heard what John said, you know, and what it does for me, John, is it breaks my heart when I see such upheaval in society, such separation, such um, it seems like there, there's so much wrong. We want to build a platform to share what's wrong with me. We want everybody to, to side with us. And, and it's really not about us. Healing is not about us. It's about that other person. And I've learned in my journey, maybe you can share a little bit of this if you ran into this, but the more bitter I became for why I was in what I was in, John, the more bitter I became and the more resentment that I had towards those who maybe affected me somehow by quote unquote putting me there, which they didn't. I was allowed to go there. That's a different story. But the, the depth of that 
if I don't get rid of that bitterness, if I don't get rid of that resentment, if I cannot finally say, look at my adversary in the face and say, I forgive you, it's okay. I'm never going to release myself into the greatness that I know I've been born for, right? John, we got to be finding this place of, of being able to forgive and let go and, and again, count it blessing, count it a part of my, my uh, processing, if you would, to get me where I'm supposed to go. Yes? Yeah, you know, um, honestly, like I'm not a, a perfect person person at all and I've made um, many mistakes honestly but what I can say is that um, I've never held grudges um, I, I don't I don't look at situations nor do I look at uh, people with malice or anger um, I'm, I'm, there, there's there's some other things in, in which I fall short but you know from witnessing my, my my sister get murdered in front of me I don't I don't hold malice there's no anger there. Um, and you run the line. I mean, gosh, uh, just being an athletic director alone, people don't understand um, the level of attack, right? Because athletics is like one of the most emotional um, arenas and platforms there is in any industry in the country. Um, and, you know, people who are very um, um, dignant and respectful and, right, they come with a certain standard and class, they get into an, an athletic arena and they completely lose their mind, right? I remember <laughs> years back, there was um, the Miami Heat and LeBron James playing for the Miami Heat. And there was, uh, I think it was, a, it, was a, it was a gentleman, it was an older gentleman, and he was on the, um, um, on the visiting side. No, yeah, visiting side. LeBron James walked through the tunnel and he's leaning over the rail, flipping him off uh, and went crazy. Unfortunately, because of social media, this the, he was a lawyer and he got fired because his, that 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 moment was was um, you know went all over the country. Um, but I'm, he's a lawyer. He knows yeah. class. He knows all this kind of stuff, right? And yet, you know, um, um, he kind of lost it in that moment. It was a playoffs and all that kind of stuff. And so I just say that to say my role as an athletic director, the amount of emotion that I face from coaches to parents to athletes to opposing schools. And I just take it with a grain of salt. I, it, it just, I, I realize what you said, um, um, me holding any sort of bitterness or anger towards something that someone's done for me is almost like me swallowing the poison and hoping it impacts them. It yeah. won't. It'll only impact me. So yeah. I, don't, I don't spend too much time with that. Yeah, so well said. Friends, I want to I wanna challenge you a little bit tonight. Um, this is rhetorical. You don't have to answer it in the chat, but I really want to just pose this. I wonder if tonight, after tonight's conversation with John, I'm, I'm going to do this in my own life. I'm going to look deep within and say, okay, what else is in you, Jeff, that is hidden? And the only way you'll know it comes out if somebody pokes you in that spot. I always used to say, John, I'm not an angry person. Just don't tick me off, right? Just yeah. don't make me mad. So that yeah. means something's still inside of me. Because what's happening, friends, when I hear you say, John, what's happening, friends, is your greatness is waiting to erupt. But every time it tries to erupt, there's a part of my soul that still needs healed, that still needs to be matured, still needs to be able to have somebody flip me off in my face and go, God love you, God bless you, and keep running. Going. There's still something, but that's not them. I don't need to fix them, friend. I need to work on me. And so my challenge tonight is throwing it down is what one thing that you could put on your list and say, dear God, universe, your faith, your beliefs, help me with this one thing. If I get rid of this one thing, I'm going to be able to be more me. And that more me is going to heal more, more people. Um, John, I, I, I appreciate you so much, brother. Thank you for diving deep with me. And friends, by the way, this is not scripted. John and I didn't talk. We just said, hey, here's how you log into the app. And I, I do that a purpose because I love these types of authentic, real conversations that we can have. Um, I wonder before we open up for some Q&A, friends, get ready for some questions or comments you have. I'd love to hear your feedback tonight. But John, I wonder if you could help us um, kind of identify your experience in working with athletes, young athletes. Do you, have you been able to see kind of repetitive attitudes, behaviors um, that, that aid to a winner versus that really restrict that one for becoming a winner? I don't want to use the word failure, but you know, those who actually achieve and thrive and those that continue to struggle throughout their life. Have you found um, formulas, components, characteristics of that winner that you could share with us a little bit tonight? 
Yeah, um, I think first for, you know, just for me, you know, as, as an athlete, I think I started considering myself an athlete at an early age. I think my first basketball team was, um, gosh, fourth fourth grade maybe. Um, and it was a great equalizer as I kind of went through different, you know, adversities and things that I faced. Um, when I got on the court, it allowed um, me to control life versus the other way around. Uh, when I was at that young of an age, life was controlling me um, and, and taking me down some roads that weren't comfortable. So, so that was great. Now, even as an athletic director, um, I see um, the same thing. In fact, uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes from Nelson Mandela reads, a sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they under, understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It's my favorite quote. I, I look at it almost every single day. It's up above my desk in my office, but it bends to the question that you ask in regards to uh, creating winners, not just for sport, but for life. Um, because every lesson that is ever needed in life happens in sport at an early age. Um, um, and, and you're talking, you know, you, you mentioned the idea of um, identifying a young person as succeeding and having the grit, having the um, endurance to run that race really well, or um, the athlete that kind of gives up, you know, and the truth is that um, the ball stops dribbling for every single athlete, whether it's a professional um, or amateur, right. Or youth. Yeah. Um, but the lessons and the connections of, uh, of the sport is what lasts forever. Um, and yeah. so when you talk about um, how do you how do you set goals, how do you prepare um, our discipline? Um, when you talk about those habits, it's interesting because, you know what, in fact, I was meeting with Prime Power Partners yesterday, a group of 40 businesses in our community, and they, they asked the exact same question. And the unfortunate part is, like, there's no secret, like, antidote of, like, I want to be able to give discipline um, – um, to every part, like it doesn't really work that way, but you can provide them the platform and the blueprint, right? So those lessons of getting up and doing the extra work and all that kind of stuff, that's a part of sport. And you do see um, the young people who commit and get through that, they do succeed. And I have so many people, uh, 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 young people that I've mentored or coached and things like that, and, and they're working adult professionals and they, their work ethic is still the same. Right. You know, they were getting up at five o'clock in the morning with me in high school. Now they're getting up at five o'clock in the morning to make sure that they can attack the life in which that makes them proud and, and, and reach their goals. So there is an absolute connection in that for sure. And my advice to parents would be to allow your kids to go through the storm, because um, the great part for me in my life and I see young people now, if you can go through the storm early you're better prepared to attack life the right way because now you're battle tested. Um, uh, you talk about languages, right? Just from an educational standpoint, it says, oh man, a, a young person under the age of 12, they can learn up to five languages so easy, but after 12, it's hard, right? Storms yeah. are the same way. A young person facing storms and different challenges and adversities, if they can face that and don't run from it early, they'll never run from a storm a, a day in their life. And, um, I think that's been true to a lot of the seasons of my life as well. Yeah. Yeah. You spark a parenting kind of thing in me. I've got four kids. Uh, the youngest is that will be 18. And they go from 18 to 25. But, you know, John, the only kind of parenting that I knew how to do was the parenting that my dad knew how to do. And that I didn't always glean the best from him. But I say that to say I thought parenting was let me let me protect my kids. Yeah. Let me keep them safe. So yeah. therefore, I'm going to make sure they don't do this and they yeah. do do this. Yeah. And it spent a lot of years raising these kids this way. I'll never forget. I had a conversation with Cammy. Um, you know, Cammy, my oldest, right? And I told her she's about 17. She's 25 now. Just graduated with her master's. I'm pretty proud of her. But I remember having this conversation with her, John. And I said, I looked her in the eye and I said, Cammy, I want you to know something. And she said, what? I said, your daddy is not right. And mm -hmm. she, she looked at me kind of uh, confused and she said, what do you mean? I said, the voice that you hear in my head that I've taught you with is my voice. That's what I believe is right. And I thought the greatest, I said, the greatest gift I could give you is to let you know that I'm not right. I'm right according to the way I think, 
But unless you develop what you believe is right, you're always going to rely on what I think is right. And you will always be confused and you'll always struggle. So it was almost a moment, John, of me letting go of her going, I want you to figure this out on your own. Um, I'll never forget when her mom and I put her on a, a plane to Australia for six months. She's got a backpack. We're dropping her off in LAX, and she's gone for six months to, to Australia. So we can't keep, I, I guess I shared all that to say, we can't keep them from the pain because if we allow them to go through it in a, in a supervised environment, right? Kind of like we're the bumpers. <laughs> yep. We don't, yep. we don't yep. get in there and keep them, but we're the bumpers to help them. Yep. And what yep. I hear you saying is that's where they develop that resilience at, yeah? A hundred and ten percent. And unfortunately, it's especially in um, um, a demographic, a socioeconomic climate like we live in in the Valley, um, it seems that more parents do want to put the bumpers on, right? And in and, and athletics, in school itself, is, so, is, is the safest place to allow young people to embrace adversity, face storms, take accountability, to d- do that now. And, 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 and it's going to hurt, it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's going to be like, uh, you know, minuscule compared to the real storms of life. And I know everybody on this call right now, we've all faced something that was unbe- unbelievably difficult in our adult age. Um, um, and so if our young people can kind of face um, levels of that at, at a young age, I think they'll have a healthy perspective on it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I love it. Oh, he's amazing to me. My youngest son now, Braden, he, he's the one that's going to be 18. He plays on the football team, right, John? And yeah. uh, so he's on the football team. He loves football and he loves to hit the gym. So what's amazing about this kid is that kid will get up at 4.30 in the morning, John, fix his protein shake, down his eggs, do whatever he's doing and hit the gym. But I can't get the kid to pick his pants up off the middle of the floor. It's like, Mm -hmm. come on, something doesn't compute here. But Mm -hmm. the reason it doesn't, it's taken me a while to do this. I always believe, this just kept coming to me when I was hearing you talk. I've always said that one discipline affects all the rest. In other Mm -hmm. words, I believe that if I was a disciplined person in one area of my life, I would be a disciplined person in the other area of my life. And that isn't holding much weight for me, John. And the reason is, is because Braden's why is attached to pumping that metal because he knows when those arms get buff and his chest gets buff, the 300 pound lineman knows when he's the, he's the center won't take him out as easier. Yeah, so he's got sure. a strong enough why to get that discipline working to go to the gym at 430, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100, 110% and, and, and getting up early like that will stick with him for a lifetime. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. So super cool. Hey, I want to shift a little bit, friends. I want to open up in just a couple of minutes, ask questions. Um, uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about, because I know that you have um, programs, you offer programs to educators. Can you tell us a little bit about the services, John, that now you are providing for other educators, for other school districts? Talk to us a little bit about the services you offer others that you can help them in the and what areas you help them in. Yeah, so um, I, I know that the, the title was Unlike, Unlock Your Success, you know, and this hour has blown by. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but I feel like there's still chapters and layers that we didn't we weren't able to kind of uncover. Um, but it is a great segue that you asked that question, because um, unlocking your success really is the advocacy work for me, understanding that, you know, um, I, as an African-American male, I represent you know, 3% of African, uh, African American school administrators in our country. And, um, you know, as, as a former foster youth, um, gosh, I represent, you know, 4% of foster youth who actually graduate and get a degree. In fact, 50% of foster youth, by the time they graduate, they end up uh, homeless or in jail. So um, when I realized that going through some different equity lessons and things that I've gone through uh, in my life, I realized that, A, you know, I'm thankful and blessed that I'm here, but also, um, I I don't want to say discouraged, but discouraged that there's not others standing with me in this line or this plane. And I want to do everything I can to pull up every young person who's facing that level of adversity and letting them know how it's possible, right? So that's where this idea of unlock your success uh, kind of came from. And so that's where my book, Letters from an Educator, The Child You Didn't See, it talks about being, it's, it's a book about empathy. So it's written through the lens and the scope of education and me being an educator. But at the same time, many have read it and said, 
you know what? Um, this this book applies to life and humanity is a book about empathy. And we all need to be able to ignite and, 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 and cling on to empathy as much as we can. And if we do that, our relationships uh, will be better. Um, so that's what the book is about. And then the curriculum and the course that goes along with that um, goes deeper. The book kind of highlights and it puts a bow on empathy. And you'll see how it became alive in my life and the work that I do. And then the curriculum that goes along with that is introspection. So whoever picks up the book and gets the course, that's their own inner work that they can do uh, with that. So that goes to schools. It's been to different nonprofit organizations who work with uh, young people and it's for the adults. Um, and then in a few short months, the, my poetry book could be out along with the curriculum for young people, because uh, in order to embrace like we started this conversation talking about being vulnerable. Well, there's so many people who go through things that are, um, they're afraid to be naked, right? Like we, that's what we talked about. Like, why do you feel emotionally naked? You know, well, you, you have to be bold and convicting and you can't be afraid to be transparent. Well, step one of that level of transparent transparency is being honest to yourself. And there's levels of conversation prior to the season I'm in now in life. I never had that conversation to myself. I couldn't even sit in a quiet room and talk about my authentic emotions or experiences that I went through. So for me, that's where poetry was birthed. And that's where um, I was able to kind of take ownership. And so this curriculum, the first the poetry book, um, um, you know, Diary of a Poet, and then the curriculum that, that goes with that allows an individual to do that inner work, that self work with themselves so they can put themselves in a healthy, confident position. Um, that will then allow them to be a, 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 um, a lighting path, a lighting torch for others to be able to lead their life boldly as well. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I was looking at your website or actually your Instagram and you have a post that reads to the warriors, to the depleted, to the fatigued, to the overachievers. Listen to your body. You are enough. You've done enough. Rest. Wow. It, it just, I, friends, I don't know if it sits well with you tonight, but have you ever found yourself tired of being tired? <laughs> you, we're, we're, we're exhausted trying to fight our way out, find our way out, become our way out. Do, we're always about doing, 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 rather than simply being, being being. And that's what I read in that post of yours, John. Rest for all of these warriors, for all of those that fell, feel defeated. Mm. Um, you're enough. Mm. Tell, no. tell, tell, somebody, tell, tell somebody tonight, John, that they're enough. I just want to put you in that role for yeah. a moment. Can, would you allow me to do that? Go, go, brother. Yeah. yeah. 110% you're enough. You, 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 the, the warriors, right? The stressors, and, and you brought those words out, the ones who feel anxiety. But for me, Jeff, right? When you talk about childhood trauma, one of the side effects of childhood trauma is that we're inadequate and um, we're, we're people pleasers, right? Childhood trauma, a, a, a side effect, like we're always trying to please someone so we feel like we belong. We, we want something, we want a group of people that we can belong to. So, the overachievers, right? Some people would say that I'm an overachiever, but the idea of me always working and feel like I need to do more, I need to be better, I need to, don't stop, right? My fiance always says like, do you know how to rest, right? But there, there's an, this thing in me that I have to go and I don't even sit and appreciate an accomplishment before I try to attack the next goal. And that's very, very unhealthy. Like we talked about, everyone has a, a timestamp at some point. And if we don't, find those mileposts in our lives to stop and say, I'm good today. I'm good right now. Um, if we don't do that, it's going to be very, very unfortunate. It's going to be one of those things that we'll, re we'll regret uh, uh, later in age for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love what you said. I dropped it in the chat. The, the, the effect of childhood trauma is feeling inadequate. I, if there is an epidemic that I believe is one of the worst epidemics humanity has ever faced is the feeling of not enough. Not enough, John. And I think what I, what's wonderful about society, what's wonderful about creators um, and, and thought leaders like you is you're bringing, I think you're shining a light on what's going on in our own soul. And we go, mm -hmm. oh, my God, he's talking about 
me. Mm. It's not that there's anything wrong with me. I think a lot of uh, the first wave of healing shines a light on us to show us that something's wrong with us, but that's Mm. not it either. It's just Mm. simply to illuminate so that we can be okay with just taking our hands off of it, letting it go, sit with it and letting it pass through us. Mm. I've always said what we, what we resist persists. Yeah. What we resist persists. So we just got to take it, our hands off of it and let it go. But this feeling of not enough. I mean, I I grew up with, we hear the term of perfectionistic father. John, my dad was my, and I love my dad to death. He's gone now. But when, when, when I grew up, the dishes had to be done a certain way. The glasses had to be put away a certain way. The cups had to be put away a certain way. And it's hitting me, John, because I just saw this in my son. He's 19 now, Luke. Um, Tonight he, he, he had a, he's, he made this beautiful transaction, or transaction for a, another car, and he was up in Duluth coming back from a trip, and the car had a radiator problem. And um, now, listen, I'm going to try to get this out. Had a radiator problem, John. He pulled off, got the tow truck and everything else. When he came back, John, he was explaining to me the steps that he had taken to make sure that he did everything. And as he was telling me, Dad, I did this, and then I did this, and I, I made sure I put my, my, my shirt over the radiator cap and turn it so that it wouldn't explode on me. John, the reason he was saying all of those things is because he was trying to tell me, Dad, I did it the right way. I, I mm. did it the right way because somebody who is seeking to be validated to do it the right way is seeking validated because they don't believe that they're enough. And the reason they don't feel enough is a perfectionistic father holds a standard over a child that they could never, ever live up to. There is no grace, freedom, uh, ability to mess up, fall down, and just hear those words, I got you. My God, yeah. friends, if I, as a dad, if I, I mean, if I could go back and do anything differently, now I do it as much as I can, but I hear it still coming out in them, John, that mm. I'm not enough voice comes out in them because guess what? And, and I don't know why this is so strong in my heart, John. Thank you for your grace and let me just share it here on the air. It's because we, as a perfectionistic person that does it, we don't see that we're doing it, friend. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, realize. I think I'm helping him, John. Yeah. I'm helping him by, no, 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 the tool goes right back here, son. See this little space in the toolbox? That's where we put the tool when you get done with it. You got yeah. that? Okay, Dad. I come out yeah. on the workbench, and there it is again, out of place. So I'm yeah. helping. I'm thinking I'm helping him, John. Yeah. But what yeah. I'm doing is reinforcing him and that his decisions are not good enough, which yeah. causes him to feel not worthy enough and not good sure. enough. Mm-hmm. And he had and, here, and, the, and, the, and right, and, and I don't want, I don't want to use the word danger, but the danger part of what you're saying is um, the the freedom, the liberation to allow him to be authentically him is now handcuffed and hindered and caged, and he'll never blossom into the person that God has, who has called and created him to be. I was at Temecula Valley High School two weeks ago speaking to their audience, it was students, staff, uh, parents, families in there, and one of my talking points was that. Um, be brave enough to be yourself and no it was everyone has a gift be brave enough to be yourself and success will come so and and you can you just use the story about attire right um but i use the point of shaquille o'neal and 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 kobe bryant And, and within that point i said the goal changing attire getting to the nba the goal is to get to the nba However, the gift of Shaquille O'Neal is 300 pounds, 7'1", the most physical specimen the NBA has ever seen. Yeah. He can shoot free throws, but it's great because he had his gift, and his gift got him to his goal, which was the NBA. Kobe yeah. Bryant at 6'7", was quick. He can shoot. He can shoot free throws, and he was athletic. He wasn't going to be Shaq, but he was given a gift to accomplish the same goal, which was the NBA. And so... The, the example that you use, but the pressure that society puts on us, the reason why I'm at, at uh, 42, so at 40 years old, I started speaking and sharing poetry in this message and trying to be bold. I did that at 42. Why did I do it at 42 and not 39? Is because I was comparing my gift to everyone else's and I was inadequate <clears throat> because my gift didn't look like theirs. But now that I'm authentically me, I'm free to be me and success is coming from that. Oh my gosh, friends, you got to show up some love for that statement that was just dropped. John, thank you. You're so right. So, so right. Gosh. Wow, I'm just sitting in that for a second. I absolutely, absolutely love it. So, um, 
Gosh, we're running out of time. I, I, I've, I've been saying this now in my master class sessions. I'm trying to hold the doors open longer. John, friends um, in the house tonight, I want to just kind of respect you as well. Somebody's here. You've got a burning question. We don't have a whole lot of time, but I do want to honor the fact that you've been sitting with us. Is there something on your heart you're wanting to ask, John? Share. Um, let's take a moment, John, if you're okay with that, and pause and see if anybody in the house tonight has something to share. Um, anybody at all, if you'll do me a favor, just use your app, bottom right-hand corner, hand button. Otherwise, it's no pressure. I just, again, want to honor the time and space that you've, uh, that you've shared with us tonight as well. So, um, wow. Being enough, John. Being enough. Finding enough. Finding a why. Finding a reason outside of ourself. Reaching for a higher power than of ourself. I know that reaching to a higher power, reaching to somebody outside of ourselves to help us is, is astronomically important to us getting who, to be who we are designed and created to be. Yeah. Now, what you just said about a gift. Go for it, brother. Go ahead. I was going to say 110%. Honestly, like, you know, everyone in this room, I don't know how many people in this room right now, but everyone in this room, if they can think of someone they admire, um, it can be an athletic figure, a spiritual figure, um, um, someone in corporate America, corporate America, if they, that you, if you can think of someone you admire and the platform that they had, the lane and the vehicle in which they served uh, in regards to what they did for a profession, the highest level you can go and like, wow, they accomplished so much. And you ask them why it's going to be connected to humanity and relationship and aiding and wanting to serve other people. Um, and that's the way out. Right. That's that's truly, truly um, the only way you're going to find um, ways to overcome. The only way you're going to find purpose, only way you're going to find fulfillment um, is it has to be tethered to that. Because if it's only if I'm, I'm so I'm upset, this is my storm. And if it's only about you, that will not be enough motivation to get up and get out. It's going to have to be t tethered to something or someone else. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember hearing, I think her, her is Lisa Nichols, this, is her name, I believe she's a motivational speaker. I remember listening to her story, John, she was saying that she reached that poverty place in her life, you know, single mom trying to raise this little baby, and she had no money, she was broke. I think she had $11.70 to her name, and she's wrapping her baby in a towel because um, uh, she doesn't have any diapers and she said she remembers having this cataclysmic moment that happened in her and as she's right wrapping this baby her baby she puts her hand on her son and makes this declaration she said we will never be broke or mm. broken again mm. now 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 friends we we re see the challenge with that john is that in our own ability we have the ability to honor and we have the ability to dishonor if I don't hold what you say in high enough regard, I'm mm. going to let what you say that has the power to change my life, I'm going to go, ho oh, hum, heard that before, and it will never stick. It's said with the same impetus, the same power, but we don't receive it as truth. That's where the Holy Scripture says you'll know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. you, you, the, the tr you just don't hear the truth. You can't just hear it. You got to know it. You got to be mm -hmm. known as that intimate word. You become one with it. It means it speaks to your DNA, and that's what I heard Lisa say. That's what I'm hearing you say. I'll never be broke or broken again, friend. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can take away from our conversation tonight the power, the strength, that inner charge, that Holy Spirit talk, as you had said earlier, John. So what's mm -hmm. what's what's bugging you so bad right now? You say. I will never be broke. I'll never be broken again the rest of my life. What's your statement? Find mm. it, write it on the mirror, carry it on your phone, put it on your rear view mirror in your car. Every time you feel sorry for yourself, get it out again and remind yourself, this is the freaking reason I'm getting out of this mess. This is the freaking reason I'm healing. This is why yeah. I'm going to get out of this relationship that's devastating. Right, John? God, Yo. I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you. God. Mm. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Yeah, that's good. Well, listen, friends, um, you've been listening to John Dressard. If you're in this room, you're an educator, or if you know of an educator that is looking for um, 
a leadership speaker, motivational speaker, someone to come in and inspire either the youth or talk to the leadership team of the school. I really encourage you to visit John's website, find out, get in touch with him and pass his name along. I would encourage you to reach out and grab his book. You're going to find nuggets that are going to help you get through what you're going through. And it's not just about what what I love what you said tonight too, John. It's not just about getting through, Mm -hmm. but it's about getting to. Yeah. Some of us go, oh my God, I'm out of it. Well, no, 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 no. The only, you, you got a whole lane to go, right? Because it's Mm -hmm. not just about getting out of it, but it's Mm -hmm. about getting to it. And getting Mm -hmm. to it means you're helping other people. Yeah. Now you're going to use it to, to multiply yourself. So friends, visit his website. It's in the chat. Visit his Instagram. Give him a follow. Reach out to him. John Broussard, I thank you, my friend, for being on the Circles app with me tonight and having this conversation. I appreciate you. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. I was honored to be here. I'll come back anytime. And thank you for everybody in the attendance tonight as well. Appreciate you guys. I love it. All right, my friends, can you show some love in the house for our guest? John Broussard, a little heart button, uh, bottom right-hand corner. And uh, without, if there's no other questions or comments, we're going to close our room tonight. At the conclusion of this, you're going to have an opportunity to share your feedback with Circles about tonight's masterclass. Would you please take a second to rate it? Share some nuggets that you've taken with you. Share some kudos and some encouraging words back to John. He'll be able to see your feedback as well. If you're the first time in one of my rooms, this is what you can expect every time (laughs) we have these raw conversations. And I don't know about you, but uh, you being you helps me be me. So I appreciate you being in attendance tonight. That's our time. God bless you all. Thank you for being a part of Circles, John. Thank you. We wish you the very best. And we hope to have you back here again. Absolutely, my brother. Talk soon. All right. Good night, everybody. All right, bye.